In a world where you have meme coin dynamics and GameStop economies, uh -huh. you know, people that are bored on Reddit can start stuff. You know, as you said, Pepe coin. I mean, bored teenagers in a basement can now take down banks in the US. Hello and welcome to DeFi, the crypto storytelling podcast that is the ideal audio companion while you do the dishes. So go ahead, grab your sponge and scrub those dirty plates that have been piling up since Bitcoin pizza day. My name is Jonas and today on the show we hear the story of Michael Svoboda, the CEO of the company that built Liquity. Liquity of course is one of these dangerously underrated Ethereum gems. It's a protocol that is like a vending machine where you can borrow against your Ether and you get a stable coin back. It's called LUSD and we dive into all of that. But let's be honest, what truly adds flavor to these discussions aren't the technical details and the intricacies of those DeFi protocols. It's the passionate stories our guests bring to the table. When they break free from the rehearsed PR speak and reveal their unfiltered perspectives. And trust me, Michael doesn't disappoint. He shared some incredible stories about how Justin Sun locked in a billion USD worth of ETH within the very early days of Liquity, an unproven protocol, and how he almost got liquidated. And he also brings on the heat when talking about the ongoing banking crisis and how DeFi really can shine and prove its usefulness while banks are crumbling left and right. Are you ready to dive in? But before that, a quick word from our sponsor. CryptoValley.jobs is a job board where engineers, designers, analysts, traders, and community builders can find cool crypto jobs. Full disclosure, I run this job board. So if you're looking for a job or you want to advertise an open position, please go and visit CryptoValley.jobs. And while you're there, make sure to sign up on the email lists so you're always informed when new jobs are posted on the platform. That's CryptoValley.jobs. And now let's start the show. If you want to get your company or project in front of our growing audience, visit defire.money or send me an email jonas at defire.money to learn more about the defire community. You know, I do this podcast also because it gives me access to interesting people like you and I can ask the questions that are burning mm -hmm. for me. And let's say I have some Eve lying around right now and I would like to do something smart with them because you know, it's the bear market, not much is going on, right? What could I do with my ETH with liquidity? What would you suggest to me? Yeah, sure. I would suggest to you to do, for example, what, what a user of us did, Marcus is, who is from, I think, Guatemala. He wanted to buy a car and he had also some ETH. And of course, my first advice is don't sell your ETH. <laughs> stay, okay. stay long ETH. But then he, he was thinking, okay, how could I, can I finance this car? without selling the ETH. So he went to, to his bank mm -hmm. uh, to ask, hey, can I get a loan? I, I, I think it already took three days. He would have needed to onboard to this bank. And the bank said, hey, great, we give you a loan for 20%. But in terms of the, of the ETH? Or just... No, just kind of a loan for just, a car, let's yeah. say 20,000, and you pay 20% on it. And then he said, hey, that's great. That's the traditional way. Now let's see kind of what I can do in DeFi. And he looked at different protocols. And Liquidity was one of, of them. And what he can do with liquidity is he can take his ETH, deposit his ETH in liquidity as a collateral, as a security. And then the protocol mints him a stablecoin, the stablecoin called LUSD, mm -hmm. interest-free. You know, compare it with 20% with, with the bank. Interest-free means he only paid 0.5% one-off fee. So that's the total cost. You know, he can have his loan as long as he wants and has it financed really cheaply. I think that's the power of liquidity. And that's what he did. He has now his car with this loan. So that's the main use case. It's a borrow use case. People that hold crypto and don't want to sell the crypto can take out a loan for their everyday expenses, for their mortgage, or to even buy more ETH to leverage up. I think that's one side of the protocol, the borrowing side. And then I mentioned the stable coin, that that's a whole nother thing. It's I think it's just the, the probably the most sound and resilient dollar you can you can hold, but we can touch on that later. Okay. 
Yeah, that's interesting because stable coins, of course, have been in the news lately a lot, right? I mean, a, a, a while ago, it was UST is the, from Luna, the algorithmic stable coin that reigned in the whole bear market, let's say, right? We, we can say that. And also lately, USDC by a circle and also Tether is always in the news. And that's actually how I got back to Liquid TV. LUSD came as the winner out of this drama, so to say. Can you recap quickly what happened, how, how you have experienced it more closely? Because you were obviously also in the stablecoin market. Yeah, I mean, what's the, what's the drama? I mean, we just see that we are still very reliant on the traditional financial system, which has some cracks recently. I mean, we saw it with USDC. What happens if a bank isn't liquid? You know, that's what happened to USDC. Then it's de-packed because it wasn't fully backed anymore. We see now with the banking crisis, all these stable coins out there are backed with dollars or treasuries that are held in a bank, that are held in a jurisdiction. And that comes with risk. Mm -hmm. And I think what people need to realize, not all dollars are created equally. And every dollar has its own risk. You know, probably the safest is cash because cash is backed by the U.S. government and you can directly redeem. But the dollar you hold in your bank account, there you have a counterparty risk. That's commercial bank money. So there you have the risk of the bank. And now we realized with the smaller banks in the U.S., the risk is probably bigger than with the bigger ones. So that's why you have these liquidity crunches and people moving around. And then you have stable coins, but stable coins is, is nothing else than U.S. Treasury held somewhere in a bank. And that's, I think, what people realized with this whole SOC on, that's still a very big risk. And there it's really where I think LUSD shines. LUSD is such a beautiful and sound stablecoin because it has such different properties and such different risks that nobody else offers, really. And, and that's big to say because the stablecoin market is going into the hundreds of billions. And LUSD isn't so big. It's in the millions, hundreds of millions. But still, no other dollar, I would even say, has the properties of LUSD. And I can break it then, then down. But, but I think that's really the unique and beautiful thing about liquidity LUSD, but also about DeFi. So now, why, why, do you need, why do we need DeFi? And I think liquidity gives a really nice example. On the one hand, it creates another form kind of, of dollar value. So you really get an alternative that you hold the dollar, that it's back, that you have less counterparty risk. And also on the borrowing side, you get a whole new offering you don't get from the traditional system. Both have advantages and disadvantages, but just having this alternative is really cool. And all created by DeFi or by a protocol. And, and just what does a protocol mean? And you mentioned it. I really like the, the comparison to a vending machine. The liquidity protocol is a vending machine out there. With two advantages, you know, it's, it's not reliant on somebody to fill it up. It just works on its own. And that is what liquidity has done. Liquidity has been out for two years without us doing or helping anything in the wild, mm -hmm. just working. And it managed four billion in loans. It gave out four billion in US dollar loans just on its own. That's crazy. That's, uh, it's that, that's totally crazy. You know, without back office, without, without anything. Mm -hmm. That's really a small bank in Switzerland yeah. um, just running on its own as a vending machine mm -hmm. out there. And, and, and you, you know, I think that's really important to say, hey, that's really an alternative. And it's almost like a public good. Mm -hmm. So the nice thing about DeFi, and I think why we should be here, is we are giving power into the hands of people and alternatives. I don't say yeah. banks are, are bad, but just having a dollar that belongs to you and nobody else, it's a powerful thing. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? Because just to paint this picture for people listening, I, I walked in this building here. It's a co-working space. I met one other Liquity, actually the founder of Liquity. And there must be other people obviously working for, for Liquity. But it seems to be a tiny operation. And you just mentioned and compared it to a small bank in Switzerland that would employ for sure hundreds of people, right? Or maybe even thousands. I think that's quite powerful as well that 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 you can have like as a team such an impact. Yeah, and, and that's the other totally interesting aspect about the space which brought me in and kind of sucks everybody in is it's just what you can achieve. And I say that to young people, or you see it with young people, the impact they can have, it it's just amazing, you know, building this. I mean, Bitcoin is 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 the first world currency 
that is not backed by an army and that it was just built by some developers you know that's so powerful and we are a team of 10 people only five developer and five, five other people and um, but we wouldn't be needed the protocol would still exist even if we ran down but it, it shows you just a team of 10 people was able to to build something like that and i wouldn't compare it to a bank with 100 and or 1000 people they're smaller banks but really a small bank but still you know this, these products are now out there and accessible to to everybody worldwide it's just another another type of finance that that is possible Mm -hmm. and i think that's really the amazing part and that that's also what makes me really bullish all these people coming in and not going back anymore you know Mm -hmm. so many bright people working on so many things yeah I, i haven't seen that and that was also the reason why i did the jump into the space i was working in digital transformation consulting you could say helping people to make the digital jump that was nice that was exciting but then i realized the only disruptive thing were you a consultant Uh, not a consultant i was working in the biggest telco in in switzerland so that's swisscom first on the private customer side digitizing you know the portal so you can do everything digitally then we help the enterprise clients to do the same Mm -hmm. because swisscom was was really kind of forward thinking yeah, but the realization was, you know, the only disruptive thing is, is, is blockchain. And it's not happening in, the, in these big, big companies. Mm-hmm. It's happening out there with these young developers that, that are doing crazy stuff. And that totally blew my mind. And kind of, yeah, that, that's so satisfying to, to be able to work with these people and to have such an impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's very interesting that we like maybe to go later into the, you know, like how you see the future to onboard the next hundreds of millions because right now as as we know crypto is still kind of inaccessible for a lot of people in terms of it's a little bit too too complicated it's hard to you know like keep your money safe every day we hear about hacks we hear about people that get fish etc but at the moment people listening i would say are obviously in that forefront right they are they are kind of into crypto they know some stuff and you just mentioned one use case which is People who have already a lot of money in crypto and take out a loan against their crypto. But I think the other use case could be for people who want to make more money, that they take out the LUSD and buy more Ether and leverage up their positions, right? Would you say these are the two use cases that are most prominent? And how, if you know that, how are they distributed? Do you have more people taking out loans and then buy a car or a house or, you know, you know finance something in real life? Or do you think more of them are going back and buy more Ether and leverage up their position because they're so bullish on Ether? You have both. And I would say it, it depends also on the market. You know, right now we're in a beer market, so much less people leverage up. But, but I think probably it's an even more dominant use case just kind of because it's still such a young space, which is very, very crypto native. But you have also the... The other case, so I don't know if you know Eric Voorhees, he, he's been an OG in the space and he financed like that, you know, his mortgage. And he really loved the experience that he said, you know, I open up my browser, a uh-huh. couple of minutes later, I have my, my LSD, my stable coin, I need to off ramp it. Okay. That's take some time, but then I'm fine. You know, it's, it's just so easy. It's just so open and effortless and still it's complicated. I agree. But let's not forget what it would mean in, in the traditional world to get your mortgage financed. Do you, do you know? I, I, I never took a loan in my whole life. <clears throat> Maybe you have, have. Can you quickly draw like a comparison in the steps that you have to take in the effort? In... Yeah, sure. Yeah. First, you need, I mean, if you decide with a bank, you need to be onboarded. You know, you, you negotiate the rates, which is not very transparent. I mean, that already takes a couple of days, you know, then you need to go back and forth. And once you're onboarded, you need to deposit the amount and then you, you, you get the loan. Then you're at the mercy of the bank, you know, closing it earlier or you get a hefty fees, stuff like that. So, you, you, for example, that's also a great example. Just moving your loan to somewhere else, it's almost impossible. Moving your portfolio of assets from one bank to the other, that's really hassle. In DeFi, you can do that with, with some clicks. That shows you just just the power and, and kind of, I think that that's the next era of of finance. I just talked to Robert today and he will give a, a class kind of for, for students. 
And I told him, hey, I always think that today you just open a bank account. All these students still have bank accounts. But I think the next generation, we will need to explain to them why they need bank accounts. They will just have the money on their phone, you know, and it's going to be crypto and, and they have all these services and everything is easy and, and digital. And then they need to think, okay, now it makes sense. Sometimes maybe it's good to have a loan with a bank or you need to pay taxes, mm. stuff, stuff like that. I think one difference, and now we're going to, into the over collateralization is if you take a loan out with a bank and you want to buy a house, you obviously, you don't have the money to buy the whole house most yep. likely, right? And the bank looks at your income, Maybe you have, I don't know, some, some people vouching for you, et cetera. And they make kind of predictions of how much money they can lend out to you. Obviously, when you have like a machine, a vending machine out there, that doesn't work like that. Yeah. In, in liquidity, you have to have a minimum 110% of what you, like you have to lock in 110% of what you take out. And if you do that, you're a degen because that's right at the edge of getting your collateral liquidated, right? What you put in, it will get sold if it, falls to 109%. So in that case, you can say, okay, it's very nice, but it's it's for rich people only. You can, or how, how would you argue, okay, you know, if somebody tells you that, that argument, how, how would... Yeah, totally true. You, you know, it, it's like that. But you mentioned, you know, DeFi is still complicated. Yes, agree. But I mean, let's compare it with the internet. Early internet was also very complicated. Hey, we were very afraid of the first online banking. Never ever I gonna do my payments online, stuff like that. So I think we are in the early ages. And the biggest benefit is for the people that already have some crypto, but we will be able to use the same rails, especially new companies, new people, young developers will be able to use the same rails to then have under collateralized loans. Still there, you need to have other trust assumptions. I mean, it's a whole new financial stack uh, will, will enable, I think, so many better products at the end. So yeah. I think that's why I'm still very bullish. And I mean, for the boring use case yet, it's, it's restricted, but already for these people in Argentina and South America, for example, just having the possibility to really own your money or to be able to hold it in a stable currency, stable coin, or a, a, for example, really LUSD, you know, it really belongs to you. You know, it's backed. It's, it's a safe heaven compared to being forced into your local currency. I think we in Switzerland are very blessed because why should I worry about banks? My, our currency is great. Mm -hmm. Other people just don't have an alternative. Yeah. And that's the cool and powerful thing. DeFi providing such alternatives. So even if you don't have the boring use case, for example, holding a stable coin, being able to have that stable value can be really interesting for those people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you mentioned it before, like it, it's almost like a vending machine out there. But I think what's interesting is it's, you literally have no control anymore. You don't even have the keys to open the vending machine. You build the product. And I like to imagine it's almost like a spaceship. You launch it up in the orbit. Then you even lose connection. You cannot. Now it's kind of this autonomous thing out there that has to do the job right. Because you've built it in a way that there's no governance. So which basically means there's no way that you or somebody else, even the founder of Liquidity, even that the CTO of Liquidity has access to do any changes to the code. And I, I believe when you build a product like that, I mean, it needs to be perfect right out of the gate. That's a lot of pressure. How do you make sure that it's 100% safe before you launch it? I imagine there's so much pressure. Yeah, you have to be very diligent. I mean, you said like flying to the moon. So you should have a bit this mindset. That's one thing. So very diligent how you build it, how you audit it and so on. Very careful how you launch it. Still, you know, you, you can have it gated, give it some time or just limit it so, so you can make sure it works. A lot of people look at it. And having this transparency, open sourcing code, giving everybody the possibility to inspect it, you know, it's, it's also a lot of security over time. So, so, you know, really this open source movement, this open source financial stack gets hardened and hardened. Mm -hmm. You know, liquidity got hardened over time. Yeah. And then people depositing at the beginning crazy amounts into it. I mean, that freaked out the whole team, you know, <laughs> so, so early on. I can tell you that, and that will never go away. And that's still a risk. People need to be aware of it, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't have the counterparty risk, which is already great in these times because banks just failing because they don't have liquidity. I mean, Credit Suisse in, in, in Switzerland, 
it can happen even to these big banks. But you have the technical risk. So, so it's a trade-off. The amazing thing is that you have an alternative. So that's mm -hmm. why it compares so well to the internet. It's still great that we have TV station or, or newspapers, but just having the alternative for you, you know, that you can do your podcast and have your voice out there enables so much. So, and I think it's, it's the same for crypto and DeFi. You, you mentioned it right now that in the beginning, a lot of, like there was some actors depositing a lot of ETH into the protocol right away when it was quite young. And obviously, as you say, the protocol hardens over time. As long as the protocol goes without hack, without any vulnerabilities, a lot of people have more trust in it. But it seems to me, I've looked at the, the graph, how much Ether has been locked in or also the, the, the value. It, it skyrocketed right in the beginning. And I believe one of the people, and obviously you, you don't know that for sure. Like other companies always want to know who are their customers that you can't really know. You only see what's happening on the chain. One of the, the people who deposited a lot of money was uh, Justin Sun, right? The, I, I always call him the enfant terrible of uh, the blockchain space, like the Chinese billionaire mm -hmm. who's doing a lot of crazy stuff. Can you tell us the story of what happened there? Because I think there was also some drama and some news articles written about it. He almost tanked the price of E for something. No, 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 no. I, I mean, the first thing is, why was there so much money at the beginning? It that, That's the beauty of... DeFi system and, and, and having token incentives, you can bootstrap a product much faster. So at the beginning, it was very attractive to deposit money mm -hmm. and earn, kind of become part of this protocol and earn kind of the protocol token. And that's what Justin Sun did. So he, he's a great trader, you know, <laughs> he sees the, the opportunity. And there was no drama. Everything worked well. But once he deposited and shortly after the launch, there was a big ETH drawdown, you know. So ETH price crashed on its own, yeah. but that put the whole system on a stress test because then you have all these people which have a loan. And as you said, this vending machine needs to make sure these loans are collateralized. So kind of the like in the traditional bank, you have the mortgage as a security, there it's the ETH. Mm -hmm. And if if the, the, the security isn't there anymore, you need to liquidate this position. That happens also in your bank. You know, your bank comes, knocks on your door and says, now the property is ours, or we have to sell the property. So that's what happened. And the, the crazy thing with Justin Sun was for some short moment, really short moment, one could have liquidated the position. So that's also something we don't do. The mm -hmm. protocol offers the, the possibility and then everybody can come in and say, hey, for the security of the protocol, it makes sense to liquidate these persons. I get a reward. That's why I'm incentivized to do it. Mm -hmm. So if somebody already have seen that and reacted right away, he could have made a huge profit liquidating Justin Sun. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit better? Because and I know he, he put in like something crazy, like a billion or something. Yeah. So just this is crazy. Like yeah. There's a new protocol and he has so much money or so much trust or is such a DGEN, <laughs> he deposits a billion and takes out a loan, I don't know, a couple of hundred of millions. I don't know mm -hmm. how, what his risk was, but he could go all to 90% of a, a billion, right? He could, mm -hmm. that's the max he could have taken out. Yeah. Then the ETH price dropped, how much do you, do you remember? Like around? Uh, I don't remember, but you know, it's 20, 30%. You know, it's, it wasn't just like 5%. Yeah. It was really a drawdown. And so he was under this 110% for a while. Exactly. But my understanding No, was, actually, you know? yeah. Or let's keep it simple like that. It, it was a bit different, but just say he was below the, the threshold. Okay. It, yeah. And then because it was so early, there were no bots yet who would exactly. do that? Okay. Yeah. And then just to understand, how could you make the profit? Like, and how much by liquidating him? Yeah, so let, let's say he, he put 1 billion in ETH in there, or let's say 1 billion, 100 million, and he, he took out a loan of, let's say, 1 billion. Mm -hmm. And if he goes below the threshold, he still keeps the billion in LUSD, you know. Okay. But then the, the protocol seizes his collateral, which is worth 1 billion, 100 million at that point. Yeah. So he loses the 100 million, yeah. this 10%. 10%. Okay. So th that could have earned by by the community and the people that, that would liquidate that. Yeah. So this he would take a haircut of up to 10%. 10 okay. And he, of course, as you mentioned before, he didn't take out the loan because he wanted to buy a house. He used that LUSD and now we're going into the incentivization of the stability pools, etc., to earn this other token 
LQTY, right? Which is yep. also a part of the protocol. But what is the function of that token? Why the, was, does it make sense to hold it or to farm it? Maybe first you, you mentioned the, the, the stability pool, you know? So what he did or what we, I mean, why can we give such high loan to value ratio? 90% is, is, is quite a lot, you know? Even in crypto, you get maybe 50%, so half of the value because these assets are volatile. And that was an innovation of liquidity to be able to have 90% more or less loan to value before there was only maker. So we were much more capital efficient. We had also this interest-free loan. So that was the innovation compared to maker who, who was early. And that was possible because of instant liquidation. So the protocol has some dollars to liquidate the EVE. So to buy out the EVE and make the, the protocol whole. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens in the liquidation People have, we, the protocol has the capital in the stability pool. Let's say this, this billion was in, 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 in the pool. Then these people that deposited that, the, the funds are used to buy this collateral and the collateral is returned to the people and the, the LUSD is burned. So the debt is wiped out. So we don't have at the end bad debt in the protocol. That's always the goal. So that it's always an over-collateralized stablecoin that's out there and the system is sound and don't have any losses. So the protocol was built in a way so that can't really happen or shouldn't really happen. I would like to also to go into a comparison to the, to the other protocols. And as you said, like liquidity, and we have to stress that it's really, really capital efficient, which means it's also really, really cheap to take out the loan, which is on the objectively measure, it is better for, for somebody who wants to take out a loan. However, the TVL is much smaller to Aave and Maker because they have been first, I guess. But why do you think there's so much friction? Because this alone should give you like an inflow of, of, of a lot of Ether and cash mm -hmm. uh, coming to your protocol. Why do you think there's so much friction that people are not mm -hmm. doing that in the scale that you would believe that it, it should be, you know, because it's digital. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think so that there are some buttons. two main things. First, I think liquidity is really unbeatable in if you take out a long-term low. You know, for short term, maybe the rate instead of a one-off fee is better. But for long loans, more than four, six months, I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's also, it, it's fixed. You know, once you've paid, there's no additional cost with variable rate. You don't know it, it can go up and down. I mean, we see now the, these rate hikes, so you don't have this predictability. Why do the others have a bigger TVL? First of all, yeah, that they were first, so I think that helps kind of being first in the space. And the other thing is Liquidity has chosen to just take ETH as a collateral. With the other protocols, you know, you can provide other collateral, other coins, wrapped Bitcoin and so on. So there we are very narrow. But if you then compare it, loans that are taken out against ETH collateral, just ETH, then liquidity isn't so small. You know, then maybe Aave and Maker is two, three or five times bigger. So not that much if you just compare it ETH to ETH, Apple to Apple. Mm -hmm. But, and then that's the third reason, yes, I think liquidity is still a bit unknown or should be much more known for kind of what it is. Yeah. And the others being more vocal about it or being first helped, yeah. But 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 I think, yeah, maybe we we were a bit Swiss about that or kind of also the, the initial team that built it. I, I believe it's not enough just to build a great product. I think you need to educate people and make them aware. It, it's an important part, and and we could have done that maybe a bit more, and then we we would have seen kind of a bigger adoption. Yeah. yeah. How does it make you feel that right now there's a meme coin craze, which obviously is not a protocol and you can't really compare, but it's crazy how quickly they can draw attention. Like yeah. literally in a couple of days, we have seen the Pepe coin going from zero to over a billion in, in market cap, right? Which is probably not a fair comparison to TVL, but it, it, it shows something. How do you feel like when, when other projects that do not provide any value Besides speculation and maybe, I don't know, what, what is the, the, the use case of a meme coin? Do, do you look at this and do you think, ah, you know, like the sentiment or do you think, oh, we could learn something from, from that, from liquidity? What, what is your takeaway? when you? Yeah, different takeaways. On the one hand, very bullish 
in the terms that you can see what the technology enables, what few people who can code and know how to use social media, what they can achieve. You know, mm -hmm. unbelievable, unbelievable how quickly you can bootstrap something with so much value. You know, if you compare it for the adoption for the telephone and for the TV, Facebook, and now you see these things. I mean, we are going into days or hours how, how quickly these things can happen. That's just amazing to see how this technology can be used and how powerful it is. On the other hand, it makes me a bit bearish, yeah, how, how it's used, you know. As you said, you, you know, we, not much value. Yeah, I mean, that's on a personal level. That's not something that I say, wow, so cool to see so many people getting crazy about a coin and being in front of, 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 of the screen just for that coin. But that's on the personal level and, and that's their choice. And I have no kind of bad feeling compared to, to liquidity, I mean, at the end, everybody has to, to sell where his passion is. And my passion is building this kind of system, giving access to people to control their own financial things. That's w what excites me. And I have the possibility to do it. So it, it, it motivates me to do that even more because I see, hey, there's a potential. But obviously, we can learn something of these people. Imagine what would be possible if we could get that attention, that passion to projects like Liquidity and, and other projects out there, also the whole Ethereum network and what these core developers are, are doing is so amazing. If we could bring that attention and passion to these fields, so it's more kind of a motivation to say, hey, we should even try harder, you know? Right. Look, look what great achievement they were able to accomplish, even though it's not something I would strive for and, and get a lot of satisfaction out. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned before you have 10 people working on, on Liquity. However, the product is done. It's out there. You can't really change it. What are the people doing? Yeah, so you have the developer side. They aren't doing much, you know. What, what do you want to do? The product is out there. You, you can't change it. So they are researching new ideas. We build also additions to it, or you can build addition to it. But mainly what a company would do that, brought out a drug or, or, or something else, a medicine, then you kind of research new stuff. The other people mainly are educating people about liquidity or kind of collaborating with, with other protocols. That's the beautiful thing about DeFi. You, you have this composability. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's really about educating, collaborating with other people in the space. Yeah. So would you say like business development in terms of, okay, now we have this stablecoin LUSD, how do we make it more useful? Like it, that, that, that's a big part of it, I assume, that you, you go to a protocol and say, hey, use LUSD because we, we need more use cases for it. What can we do with LUSD? Is that the main goal or, or not necessarily? <clears throat> I, I think at the end, because I said it, it's a public good, it, it's more making the community aware. So more people rally behind it. You know, we, we gifted it to the community and it's only as good as, as the community also takes care of it. So, so that's a big part. And luckily a lot of also projects reach out and have seen kind of the value of a stablecoin like LUSD in the space, because there are no alternatives that they reach out to us and we just help them to use them in their products, for example. And I read that you raised around... Six, 6 million Series A, and then later on 2.4, which makes around 8 million, a little bit more, for the company Liquidity, right? So what is the, the business of Liquidity? Can you break it down? How does Liquidity make money? I mean, I know we have the fee, but I believe also the Liquidity holders get, I heard 100% of that fee. So I'm not quite sure how you guys make money. Yeah. What was the deal with the investors? Yes, Liquidity was kind of financed through investors. And Liquidity promised to build the Liquidity protocol. So this, this great vending machine where you can borrow and develop that and deliver that. You know, that's what we got the money for. And we said, okay, now this protocol makes revenue, the 0.5%. But the company shouldn't have any um, control over it. So people who are part of this ecosystem should get all the revenue. So Liquidity can't control the revenue. So investors got this token, which gives them access to, to the revenues. That's the LQTY token. So that's what investors got back. You know, we, we gave a product and the revenue from the product, they can stake their LQTY and 
participate in, in, in the revenues. So that's actually LKTY gives, gives them access to the revenues or, or, or yield of the protocol. That, that was the whole promise. We never said liquidity in itself needs to be profitable or run. We, we were just, you could say, like a development shop tasked with that. Okay. So they didn't get the equity in the, in the liquidity company per se. It was, they got the token. Okay. That was the main point. You know, it, it, it was a bit different around the, the, the different series. Oh, that's interesting. And would you say for somebody launching a protocol, yeah. you know, what is the best way now, as you've learned also, and you, you've seen other people launching projects right now, what is the best way to go about it? If, if they want to launch something mm. that needs some, some, some initial money and the ICO craze is over, right? I mean, it, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but what you've done is basically an ICO, it seems, but with no, 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 no. With, 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 incredi- uh, with accrediting investors. Yeah, exactly. But so an ICO is, is like a public say. We went yeah. to qualified yeah. investors and just said, hey, we have a cool idea. Mm-hmm. They like to, to finance it. No, but what I meant is like, okay, the value was already in, in the token, not so much in the equity of the, the company, right? Exactly. Yeah, you know, it, it was about the sense. product. Yeah. That's not about the... Because in... when you do an ICO, never, you never get shares. You, you get a token. That... Private sale. Okay. Private yeah. Private I see what, what you mean. Because yeah. that also means every, every protocol needs to have a token. Mm, n- not necessarily. It's just a new, new way to do it or also to bootstrap. You know, for example, Yearn was such an example where, I mean, yes, they, they had a token, but he put it just out there and then people got the tokens, could get the token. I'm not even sure if they had to buy it or just use the protocol and then it was bootstrapped like that. I think that's the power of tokens and it shouldn't be token first. Token can be a great way to give something back, to give control over the product in, into the user's hands and let them participate in 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 how the protocol develops. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think one interesting thing that we, we haven't really, we have, we have mentioned it, but we, we didn't go really deep into it is that uh, Liquidity doesn't have any governance. Yeah. No, no, that also means no governance token. And I think that's actually a beautiful thing because a lot of the, the governance token kind of dress up a little bit as value accrual, but there is no value accrual. So they say, ah, it's a governance token. And then it's used as for speculation or people are kind of betting that down the, the road, somehow this token will be valuable. What was the thinking about uh, like going the other way? Because that was kind of unusual. Yeah. And I, I think that boils down to, to Robert, who is the founder. So I just joined one and a half years ago. And he's the maker and just ha- had the passion to say, hey, we, we can do that better. And he just looked at all the aspects and said, where do we need to control something? Why can't it be automated? And he wanted to really create a pure product. And that was his passion, you know, and that's why I think it's such a fascinating project and and such a cool thing to be part of such a team that, that strives for that. Yeah. And then he just said, you know, we don't need a governance. And actually it has huge benefits for the users because nobody can change it. All people are equal. You know, that's mm-hmm. the new paradigm because in traditional finance, you have a lot of asymmetries, you know, the power a bank has more powers, it controls your funds. It has more information about where these funds are. And the beautiful thing about liquidity is it's very symmetrical. You know, you have full transparency. You see your collateral anytime. That's why I said it's a really sound dollar. I mean, even with the gold standard 60 years ago, the dollar was backed with gold. Mm-hmm. But you didn't know is there enough or not. With liquidity, you know it. You see it anytime. It's real-time analytics. Nobody has more control. You control it yourself. So it's also very symmetrical. And, and, and as I said, there's nobody out there that has more information or more control than you. So it, it, it has a really a level playing field. And that's something you don't see usually. A lot of projects build controls in it or intermediaries. And I think that that wasn't the purpose why you're here. You know, some, some really good examples are Uniswap, which I think truly is in the way I see DeFi, Curve has done a great job, we have pulled together and some other projects, but actually really few ones that strive for that. And 
again, you know that the bullish thing is it's cool what's possible with DeFi. Sometimes what makes me bearish is that people don't care that much yeah. and get excited about so much other things, which I think it's just a pity. But the only thing you can do is highlighting it in, in such podcasts and just rally the people behind it, which are not only in for the kind of the when token and when moon. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. um, maybe shifting gears a little bit. One thing that we are all experiencing right now that is also taking attention away from crypto is the AI boom, right? And I remember when I used to read about AI already 10 years ago, but only now with ChatGPT, with MidJourney, with all these applications, it has really become tangible. It has been quite amazing to see from one day to the other, the adoption that people are using these products every day. I mean. I don't know about you, but I use it literally every day. ChatGPT is one of the windows that is open most of the time. I use it to write text, to get ideas, to you know go back and forth. And I've seen a lot of people actually adopt it so quickly. And crypto also goes a long time back right now. I mean, with, with Bitcoin being the first. And we haven't seen that adoption in the day-to-day. -day. What do you think could be... The, like at the moment or the killer app or how do you see the future of, of crypto or DeFi? What maybe the killer application to get this adoption going to, to onboard really like the hundreds of millions of users? Yeah, I mean, I mean two things on that. I, I think the whole NFT thing, really simple, engaging, the whole gaming thing, a lot of people are interested in. So I think, yes, these areas are very well positioned to kick it off on a mass scale. Why is crypto taking longer than AI? I, I think what a lot of people underestimate is how complicated these financial stacks are, how many pieces need to be there so it kind of you can build powerful solution, how all these things are intertwined. Chat GPT is really simple, you know, you just need to browser and you can plug it into a lot of things and it, it works right away. Finance is just such a big and complicated stack and rebuilding that in the green and then terms of rewiring into the existing thing is really, really tough. And you see just crypto native stuff, we can send each other funds. So that's everything easy, but just bring it into real life is much a harder job and will take longer. Like, like the internet took also quite a long time. You need to have the bandwidth. So we need to have the transaction throughput. You need to understand the technology. You need to believe in it. We we need to have the infrastructure, custody and other things on and off ramping. You know, you need to have the warehouses, the shipping stuff, all, all kind of digitized and, and grow. That took 20 to 30 years. It will be the same for crypto. And AI is, it's really, truly fascinating. It caught me on the, I was very surprised, you know, and I studied computer science. I did AI 20 years ago and it's even older, yeah. you know. And already 10 years ago, you had some advances in very narrow fields. And I always love the people that say, you know, AI and it will be a danger. And I said, you know, it's so narrow and you, you need to have the data. So it's so clear. Yeah, it can help there. And then I didn't look at it and I was totally surprised how quickly it just did this magically. I didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. And it's truly frightening. You know, before I was loving people that were frightened by AI, I say, look, that's so stupid. It's some patterns you can train it, and then it recognizes a voice. Oh, oh, great, you know. Mm -hmm. But this has a dimension. It's truly fascinating, and it's so fast. And you know, now it started to frighten me. Just looking at my kids, I have kids that are twelve and thirteen, and I just realized in the social media world, applied to that, it gets really hard to understand. Hey, what's now the truth here? What's created? Yeah. yeah. You know, like yeah, what was the so. what was the movie with Tom Hanks? The you know where he lives in his bubble. The I don't. <laughs> I know it's not the terminal. But no, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. The airport. Um, no, I don't know that one. Yeah, but where you don't know, hey, is this world real, which I perceive through through my channels and not? And mm -hmm. the only thing to figure it out is either you have somebody that has its credentials put out there, or you need time. Yeah. You need to wait six hours and see what, what, what happens until this does settle. And I think that's just really crazy. I wasn't expecting that. So you think the danger is not necessarily that AI will become so smart and will destroy the humans because we are in the way somehow. You think more, okay, bad actors are using the technology for misinformation, such things. Yeah, it gives really a lot of power. You can control mass communication in a way 
where you're not sure that the, these people say that. You hear it on 20 different channels in, in different forms. You even hear it personalized to you. Mm -hmm. So you get really can be manipulated easily. I mean, that for me was right now the, the biggest danger. Of course, it, it will make you more effective. You know, my daughter really li likes to do design and, and art. I'm just saying, hey, you know, illustration, we, that will be really a tough job and it, it's becoming a niche. Stuff like that, I see it there too. But being in the digital space, that has been something, you know, that has been always the case. Things get more efficient. You need to adapt to this technology. And as you already did, you know, you're younger. So I see it, you already integrated it into your daily life. I'm, I haven't done that yet, but I just see how quickly that is and how this gives superpowers to these people who use it. And especially in countries outside of Switzerland, all these people where they have a not such a good education system, they can get more powerful with, with this technology that will put a lot of pressure or make everybody more equal, which, which is nice, but you will compete with much more people. Uh, you have this aspect too, but the other aspect of the mass manipulation frightens me much more because I don't really see how to deal with it. And with the internet, we saw that. And, and as before, you asked me about crypto they, there, I think it's always the same. I think it's amazing what the technology can do. And then I'm somehow disappointed and I say, hey, how far has the human race gone that we use now this technology mainly for that or get excited about that aspect of the technology? Yeah. For me, I, I mean, I'm bullish crypto, but I also see the human nature and also feel it myself sometimes, of course, it's Currently, the use case that has the most traction is always equation, unfortunately, still. I mean, people are excited when the price goes up, right? And it doesn't matter which token it is. It's just, this drives people in. I think that yeah. for, in terms of adoption and speculation has been the driver so far. It, it's emotions, you know, what is driving people? People want to feel, to be alive. These are the, the emotions, you know, sharing an NFT, trading a stock. I think that's something people enjoy very much and, and drives them, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, it's also fine, you know, I mean, yeah. why, why not? We, we just need to realize that we are probably wired like that. And that's why we see, see these things. Yeah. I also believe that in, in a lot of countries, it is really hard as a young person to climb up the ladder and you feel like you have a disadvantage in terms of. You know, like the millennials always say, you know, you, you boomers, you could buy a house and and we 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 have nothing, right? I'm not sure if it's hundred percent true and also in other countries like South Korea, for instance, where they have a lot of speculation going on, it seems to be a very a hard ladder to climb and it's very competitive. And I think a lot of people put their hope in getting rich quick and in this new thing where actually the old guard is not yet in. I feel that's also a little bit of a driver, like try to find a new way to climb up the ladder quickly. Yeah, but I think that that's always been the case. It's just a new way where it can do and maybe more accessible as you could yeah. do it. And, and you know, I, I agree, the boomers, wow, they had probably the best century of all humans ever, you know, kind of the last hundred years or after the Second World War, that generation just got very lucky. Yeah. And I think the next generation won't be so lucky. But on the other hand, I have to say, the young people never had this possibility. I mean, even I, I don't know, I mean, 20 years older or 15 years older than you. When I finished my studies, you know, it was very clear that the internet was just starting. I had to go to a company and do all these things step by step. I didn't have the possibilities laid out. Today, if somebody can, can program on its own with YouTube, with a YouTube video, with 14, he can build, you know, products like Liquidity. And bootstrap a paper coin or do crazy things. And I think there, hey, the, the young generation, it's unbelievable how they could, if they wanted to, outperform the boomers. Yeah. But they, they, yeah. people will say, maybe looking back to our generation, say, ah, this guy had it easy. They wrote the crypto wave. <laughs> Ether was then only $1,000. Now it's impossible. Maybe, maybe yeah. that would be the view looking back in the future. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the history of Bitcoin, it's is great, but it's just kind of, yeah, you creating a new elite that has been in there early, you know, as much as, as I like Bitcoin, it's just kind of, on the one hand, 
it's really great. But then, you know, when there, there is the magic threshold, once you have more millionaires from Bitcoin than from the traditional world, yeah. I think that that's amazing to see, hey, wow, that's possible. It makes me again bullish to say now a, a whole new breed of people that were somehow crazy or believed in something really early on has now more power. Wow, that's an interesting new dynamic. So that, that's really cool. On the other hand, you say, you know, now it's a new elite and everybody that came later um, has just a much harder, harder time. And, yeah. and Eric Borges said it recently and he said, you know, you, yeah, you, you, you get, you get in kind of at the price you paid, paid for Bitcoin saying, you know, that the people also took a risk and they were early and they should be rewarded. And if you kind of just come late, then, then the opportunities are a bit smaller. I mean, it, it's a bit of brutal market. It's, it's like that, but, but I agree that it might create a new elite. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I'm not sure if Bitcoin would be around hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, then that threshold would have been met that there's more kind of, and th- that's not, right? that's not far away. You know, I think it's actually exactly also that number, but I, but I wasn't sure it's just kind of mind blowing, you know, what, wow. Yeah. Just but seeing this grassroots movement, uh-huh. but I would feel that would not be sustainable, to be honest, because then you have like a centuries of like economic activity and people building their empires, and then some people who who are just early would leapfrog them. I don't think that would like hold them the price. I don't know. I I don't see why not. You know, to what do you compare it? I mean, is our current financial system and governance sustainable? If you compare it to that, maybe Bitcoin is more sustainable and more sound that's why people like it and if you see how others have raised you know ray dalio's kind of curves of nations and nation currencies that rise you know always had you have the english people that had their colonies and that's why they they rose was it sustainable there can you can have millions of colonies sometimes it just flattens and they were early there and they just took it you know maybe then something new is coming and that's then the next wave so yeah I would just say I don't see why it couldn't be sustainable in, in the way previous waves have been. Yeah. Looking at, at that perspective, would you say it was smart for liquidity to use USD as a stablecoin denominator? Because you could have yeah. any arbitrary product, right? You could make a stable Swiss franc, which sure. from my personal opinion would probably be a more hard currency. Yeah. But even that, obviously in the grander scheme of things, is a fiat currency. Would you do something different? Would you say, hey, we, we you can take out loans against LBTC? Yeah, I mean, you, you need probably something denominated in a value you can handle, which doesn't fluctuate. And the dollar right now is still very good. People think in, in dollar terms and, and it's currently the, the reserve currency. So I think it makes a lot of sense. You see it, euro or Swiss franc stable coins are much smaller so on the short term or looking back I, I wouldn't change anything i mean it's just a fact looking forward mid long term will the dollar stay as a reserve currency no i also think there will be a multi bipolar world and powers are shifting mm-hmm. it's really difficult to say w- what will prevail or how it will evolve so it's much more unsure but that's mid to, to long term game yes where, where it, it won't be the same as, as it has been so far with the doll. I think we, we can wrap it up. Sure. But I would have some, some rapid fire questions. Yeah. Don't get too hung up on them. It's it's coming out of the your feelings right away. It, it doesn't mean it will be taken out of context. Let, let's go easy and then we, we, <laughs> we, we go a little bit more difficult. So let's start with a, a vanilla coffee or tea. Past coffee, future tea. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> right now? <laughs> Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> Bitcoin or Ethereum? Ethereum. Meme coins, hell yeah or no way? Not interesting. What will the price of ETH be in one year? Not interesting. Okay, what will the price of ETH be in one year? I, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm bullish about the technology, about all these uh-huh. people, and it, it will go, I'm sure, in the right direction. Okay, uh, up on it. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, scale and time it doesn't matter yeah would you rather hold 100k in LUSD or in USDC of course LUSD we didn't came to that but wow that's a whole nother thing you, you know understanding what you hold with LUSD 
-hmm. versus USD on your bank account versus USDC. Yeah. And I just realized it in, in the past months. The dollar is not a dollar. It's not created equal. There are different risks attached. So that would be a whole other thing. You said this rapid fire question, but that's really clear. But it, it, it burns on my tongue because I think, hey, we haven't spoken enough in the space about that. And in general, about people, what, what, what it's mean and, and how a wonderful product LUSD is in that, that sense. Maybe, maybe we can use that as a, as a closing quote. In terms of like, what, what would you like to say about, about the difference in holding LUSD to USDC to USDT, right? Tether, there's always in the news, kind of this black box. Because I think it's something important. Yeah. I mean, I just realized when I looked at our own treasury, we have some dollars from the investors on the bank account. We have some USDC. And I was just thinking, hey, these banks kind of collapsing, withdrawals that get more difficult to our banks. So the USD rails... It's really unpredictable. Then I realized, hey, the nice properties of LUSD, it's dollar denominated, you know, but, but, but it's really different because it's over collateralized. You can redeem it at any point. You see it at any time. Your dollar in the bank, you don't know if it's still there, where it's lent out, when you get it back, if it's uh, kind of deposits or paused in the US on dollars. Mm -hmm. You have no idea. You have some risks. You don't control it. Yeah. Being able to send it whenever, wherever you want, you can do that with LUSD. Nobody can stop it. It's unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Do it with your dollars. I'm right now figuring out, hey, the dollars in my Swiss bank, where are they lying? When, under which circumstances I can still move them to, to a contractor? So there, LUSD has amazing properties no other dollar-like thing has. And then the last thing, it, 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 it's borderless, you know, it moves across borders. It, it's not in a jurisdiction. You're not dependent on somebody saying, hey, what happens with this dollar? Mm -hmm. And these are just properties that have now much more value, even from a company point of view. I have dollars, but what, what are the dollars worth if I can't move them, if they are freeze for some times or I can't access them because the bank collapsed? So I think that's really valuable because I don't see anything else that brings these values. And it has to do that people just think the dollar is a dollar. A cash dollar, a dollar you hold in your hand, is also very valuable because it's backed by the government. A dollar you have in the bank is a totally different dollar. You know, these are actually different dollars and it's totally crazy that they have the same value, actually. Mm -hmm. You would think, hey, that's totally normal. But it's actually not so clear because they have different risks attached to it. But why is the dollar in the bank account not backed by the government? I mean, if you have uh, yeah. 50,000. <laughs> yeah, how, how is it created? The money is uh, issued by the government, backed by the army and kind of the, the trust in, in, in this government. So there you have a direct claim with the government, which is quite sound, you know? Okay, let's yeah. hope US don't go bust. With the bank, that's commercial bank money. So the bank creates that money. Mm -hmm. It... In your e-banking, you get that credited, but it's created by the bank. They have the deposits, the customers, and then they can lend out money to you. That's created with the bank, and you have the counterparty risk of the bank. If you have it on Silvergate and Silvergate goes down, then your money is gone, unless the government steps in. But, you know, that's not guaranteed and only to a certain threshold. So that's a different dollar. And then you have the dollar in a small bank compared to a dollar in a big bank. A big bank is systemically important so they get rescued so the dollar there is actually a better dollar mm -hmm. than the dollar in in a smaller bank yeah why, why are they worth the same it's just because you can't trade it if you could trade it like a stable coin lsd has a premium and, and i think it's a bit because of the demand but also because it has this nice property people are willing to pay more for that dollar because it has, it has a different risk profile and you don't think about it because every dollar with the banks is the same but partially you see it, and I think it's an interesting thought. I'm, you know, it's just kind of a way to explain it that now smaller banks need to pay more on the dollars you deposit to attract the dollars because it has more risk than, than a bigger bank. Mm. Uh, you mean like and in interest? Yeah. yeah okay. That's how uh, kind of then the different risk profiles are acknowledged in a way. And further, the dollar you put in a bank is the dollar isn't sitting there, you know? Mm -hmm. It's an IOU or it, it, it's debt. It's just the bank says, hey, yeah, we pay it back, but they take it and they are a leveraged institution. You, you know, for, for the dollar I gave them, they lent out $10. And now then you have these bank runs. If everybody wants 
the money there, there aren't enough chairs. Yeah. So, you know, just thinking about the bank is, is actually closer to a car rental company. <laughs> you, I give my car to this company uh-huh. and then it belongs to the company. It's not my car anymore. I think it's anytime in, in their parking facility and I can go there and drive around. That's, that's nice. But actually it belongs to them and they rent it out to others. Yeah. And if it just happens that we all need the car, maybe the car isn't there anymore. And they say, sorry, and I, I can't use it. And that's how our cash is kind of being handled by the bank. We are lending it out. It's not that they have it. Mm-hmm. You know, and all these things, I just, I think a lot of people don't realize. And then you start seeing, especially with this banking crisis in the US, that LUSD has a totally different value. You know, again, it's fully collateralized. You see it anytime you can redeem it, there's ETH. You know, it's backed. It's it's better backed than with gold. Okay, gold is maybe the better collateral, but at least I see it with the with, with the US. Even when it was backed by gold, the dollar, I wasn't sure how much gold is there, and people started to doubt it. It can't be changed. You know, there's there's no not somebody, not the bank that, that can say you can't withdraw it, you can't send it. There, there's not a government that does it. Hey, it's it's really pure and nice asset that, that is denominated in dollars. So actually, LUSD is if denominated in dollars. Okay. But, but, but it gives you a property, you know, not, and now see in the traditional finance, see in the stablecoin market, I don't see anything else that has more or less already a major adoption that provides that. In that sense, it's really unique. And it explains a bit also sometimes why it's, it's above, you need to pay, for example, 101 right now for LUSD. Yeah. But we started to put quite some of our treasury in the stablecoin because it gives me peace of mind. Yeah. We always have it. We can always send it. Uh, it's under our control. It's mm-hmm. a self-sovereign sound dollar. Yeah. And that's, yeah, makes me really excited. And it's actually part of the product. I just started to understand when you can't take the existing financial system as granted, that it works as granted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's why... We have seen, or people say that's why I've seen a little bit the boost now in the bear market, if almost doubling, Bitcoin almost doubling. Would you say that the banking crisis has caused that run up or is that just a normal fluctuation of, of the market? Well, I don't know. I, I don't have an opinion on that. I think it makes me mid and long term bullish that we say people will realize how the financial system works, that current banks can't actually function like that anymore and that we need alternatives and that people want to have alternatives which they have under control can't be changed they believe in it they are transparent and that's what this industry provides Mm -hmm. and in a world where you have meme coin dynamics and GameStop economies Uh you know people that are bored on reddit can start stuff you know as i said pepe coin i mean bored Teenagers in a basement can now take down banks in the US and force the government to step in because it just takes 10, 15% of the bank deposits to mobilize such a mess to bring down a bank right now because they like hold 10% of deposits and lend out the, the, the other 90%. You know, that's, that has been the, the, the business model of banks. And in the age of internet and fast money and social media, you know, again, GameStop dynamics, which is seen on the stock. Imagine that now on the, 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 for, for banks with liquidity. I, I, I think there is some interesting times ahead for us. So we just seen that the first things unfold. There, there is there's more to come. In, in this, such a scenario, having my LSD mm-hmm. gives me a lot of comfort. I think that's a good closing sentence. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, Bye. thanks for, for having me. If you are still listening, chances are that you liked this episode. DeFi is not just me, it's also you, the listener. And each day there are more listeners joining and together we can spread the word about DeFi. By giving it 5 stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening. Send this episode to a friend who might be interested. Check out the website, visit defire.money and click on subscribe to get the new episode and in the future also blog posts directly into your inbox. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter at DeFireMoney. All of this helps so we can continue to produce more episodes more frequently and get the most interesting guests that you deserve. Good night and see you soon.